March 30 every year is celebrated as National Doctors' Day. It is a day set aside to celebrate these professionals for the honorous and, uh, you could add, immeasurable contributions to the well-being of the society and community. This is quite significant, especially for a country like Nigeria, where doctors are fast becoming endangered species. This is because of the rate at which doctors are reported to believe in the country. Is it because the society does not appreciate them? Or is it because they are better appreciated somewhere else? Whatever it is, the doctor is the cornerstone of the healthcare system. Today, there are about 24,000 licensed doctors taking care of Nigeria's population of about 200 million. That speaks volume to how much is expected and demanded of doctors in Nigeria. Today is a day that the society appreciates them for that great service. I am your carrier, Clinton. Welcome to Nigeria today. The celebration of National Doctors' Day provides an opportunity to discuss doctors and health care delivery. Joining me to discuss this is Dr. Christopher Otabo, Medical Director, Alliance Hospital. He's also the Chief Consultant and Orthopedic Surgeon. Welcome for coming. Thank you Thank for you. having me. Welcome okay. to Nigeria today. Also with me in the studio is Dr. Ogugua Osi. Chief Consultant, uh, Physician and Geriatrician, Department of Internal Medicine, National Hospital, Abuja. Good to have you with us on the program. Thank you for having me. Good evening. Uh, Fred, before we go into the discussion, uh, first of all, I just want to thank you and other doctors out there for the contributions and uh, for the sacrifices for those uh, late night calls they have to mm -hmm. attend to, you know, you know they, those, all the efforts they put in to saving lives in our country. And of course, more especially for not running away from the country. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Because Thank we you. have this uh, the Jackpa syndrome. <laughs> so sorry to use that word, but you know it's becoming a, a Nigerian thing, a Nigerian slang. Uh, yeah, of course, it's not just limited to the doctors, but then we see it happen, you know, almost on a daily basis. But before we go into our other discussion, I want to uh, start with you, Doctor uh, Okugua. Tell us, share with us some of the, your experience, especially in your field of um, uh, your me medicine, geriatrician. It's not so common, right. you know. Thanks uh, again, you carry So, geriatric is uh, a subspecialty of medicine where we cater to the needs of older persons. Mm. So, we call them older persons, and what's that ceiling? Um, for Nigeria and most of the world, we use the age ceiling 60. So, we're looking at the special needs of older people of, of that age bracket, 60 and above. Um, as a medical student here, I really that didn't exist. Um, I was fortunate to have my residency training, uh, to do my residency training in Pittsburgh that has the second largest population of older people in the United States. So most of my patients during my rotation were older people. So that was the beginning of my interest in geriatrics. One, it was something, it was novel, it was different, I'd never been exposed to it. Uh, and the fact that already, even as a resident in internal medicine, I was seeing a lot of older persons as, as my patients. And I found it very interesting, and up till today I'm excited um, that God gave me that opportunity. And returning home to champion um, this field of, of medicine um, has been uh, a great opportunity for me. Uh, I'm very humbly. The, Dr. Tabo, just will you just share a little bit of experience of how it's been for you as a doctor in you know, these years? You know, today we are celebrating all of you. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I graduated from medical school 1999. That's 24 years now, and the experience has been quite rich and very fulfilling. And um, after medical school, I immediately took up the orthopedic subspecialty. That's another very rewarding um, subspecialty because we deal with accident victims, broken bones, deformities, and people that have been traumatized by 
um, like either war or uh, you know all forms of injuries and nothing gives me greater joy when i see people who are carried to the hospital half dead and after performing surgeries and other medications they smile you know away from the hospital with so much you know thank you and all that so it's quite fulfilling and, and that's the kick that we get from medical practice really to see people you know revive people who were going through the, the death throes coming back alive but after many years of um, clinical practice i have metamorphosed now uh, to another level which is uh, medical administration okay. and so in that position i get to to um, see to ensure that um, people do what they have to do and that doctors um, i now begin to monitor what the other doctors do to ensure standard and to ensure that no life is lost unnecessarily that in itself also is very rewarding that, that is actually why we are saying thank you very much you. for all those uh, uh, for your uh, sacrifices. Yeah. Now, going looking at the Nigerian uh, scenario, how would you describe the Nigerian healthcare system, Dr. Ogogua? So, if we look at it just from the lens of what's happening today, just today in the world, we might say, "Oh, it's so bad. Doctors are leaving." Um, in droves, nurses are leaving in droves, we do not have enough of the healthcare workforce that we require to look after the patient. But we have to look at how far, so we can look at it just from the lens of today. As a medical student, actually one of the reasons why I actually left the country was it was very frustrating, you're in the emergency room, somebody has seizures, they're convulsing, you need to give them an injection to stop the convulsion, it's, there are no syringes available. The uh, injection you require is not available. You are asking family members to go and buy those things. And sometimes, unfortunately, before they get to the pharmacy and come back to you, the, the worst would have happened. It's very frustrating to practice in such an environment. Um, so that was one of the driving force for me to say, look, I, it, you know, you're, you're gonna get burnt out. Uh, practicing in such an environment. At the time, however, we didn't have a lot of the diagnostics that I have seen uh, since returning to the country. Um, over the last 10 years, too, we've had a lot of Nigerians in the diaspora who have returned to actually fill the gaps of some of the um, subspecialties that didn't exist, some of the um, you know procedures that people went out of the country for are now available here in the country, like renal kidney transplants, uh, interventional radiology procedures, we can now do them here. Nuclear medicine procedures, we can now do them here. So we have moved some, um, but there is definitely still a lot of room um, to do better. One major uh, problem or challenge that I see with healthcare provision here is affordability. Nigerians are paying catastrophic uh, amounts of money out of pocket to, to be able to uh, you know, access healthcare. That should not be. So we must make insurance um, mandatory, routine for everyone, but it also has to be insurance that is meaningful because what we find sometimes in what is existing, particularly on the uh, NHIS scale, is that it's the coverage could be better. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Chris, um, I know he's, she's mentioned some of, uh, just uh, want to make many, many of the challenges we have in the uh, healthcare uh, system in the country. Now, um, how far have we grown technologically in, the, in our healthcare system? And what are some other uh, challenges that you think we should need in the bud to get efficient, you know, service delivery. Um, thank you. You know, the Nigeria healthcare cannot be taken in isolation out of the Nigerian environment. So it starts from political leadership problem to the economics, and then it cascades down to the healthcare. So we are in dire need of pragmatic leadership 
people who understand what uh, the importance of healthcare. Some of our leaders have the capacity to travel abroad when they have real challenge with their health. And so because that window is available, they cannot feel what the average Nigerian feel when it comes to healthcare. So because of that, the proper attention is not given to healthcare. In 2001, African leaders came together to sign a declaration. They call it the Abuja Declaration, whereby African leaders ought to commit 15% of their annual federal budget to healthcare. That would have been the beginning of the solution to healthcare financing, which is a, a major problem. But since that time till now, I think the highest we've got in this country is about 6%. So because of that, healthcare is not prioritized. So, it, so money goes to other areas. National Assembly is budgeting so much for themselves. Uh, defense is taking so much because of the war we are fighting and others. So healthcare is left as the orphan. And if money is not pushed into healthcare, you cannot deliver efficient healthcare because healthcare is capital intensive. So that's one. So you find that from time to time you hear that doctors go on strike. The reason they are going on strike is because they are drawing the attention of the government and the people to problems. But now they no longer go on strike because they are tired. What do they do now? They pack their bags <laughs> and they are, they are out. So, so these are some of the issues. Then there are other, so I've talked about the overarching issue, which is leadership. Then when you now break it down, you now find that even starting from statistics, how many are we? We don't even know. Thank God the population census is coming now. She talked about um, financing healthcare from the pocket. Nobody does that anymore. If the insurance is working and we're able to know our numbers, we can plan. So there's poor planning. And then the corruption that has eaten deep into our fabrics is also affecting the public hospitals, such that when you go to the public hospitals, you don't have the, the desired health care. In fact, it's now a reverse. Private hospitals ought to be you know, looking up to, uh, to the government tertiary centers for soccer, but the reverse is now the case. So it's a number of problems where a doctor, a doctor's salary is less than $300 in a month. And then he's promised to be paid um, $3,000 in a month elsewhere. It's very difficult to convince such a person to stay. You know, so those are some of the challenges. But the, the, it, it will take a whole day. We won't even scratch the problems in the healthcare. But I just mentioned a few mm -hmm. of those things that the government can look into. Okay. Now, um, uh, Dr. Gugwa, I came across a report that said between February two to march 15 2023 this year alone 162 nigerian trained doctors were licensed to practice in the uk mm -hmm. we're just talking about the uk alone we're not talking right. about us, US. Not about canada and other you know other countries which means at least three doctors were licensed daily within this period uh, i mean <laughs> how Staggering. urgent do we need mm. to tackle Staggering. this problem of uh, brain drain right so it's Dr. Tabo has mentioned I'm glad, we have, I'm glad, to, we have so to think about before you the start, environment. I'm, I'm, but before you start, sorry mm -hmm. to cut you there. I first of all want to appreciate you for training abroad and coming and back and returning. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> for me when you were saying that, I said, wow, <laughs> that's uh, uh, well, <laughs> it's commendable. Right. Okay. And actually, maybe before I even go on to go back to what Dr. Tabo said, it's not about just the 3,000 versus the 300. Mm -hmm. There's so many perks for you for being in your own country. The relevance, you really can't put monetary terms to it. Uh, the fulfillment from the fact that you are contributing to your own society, you're contributing to the healthcare of your own people. You really can quantify that. So it's not really just about the money. There are stresses you know that people go through from being living abroad as well you're a second class citizen you're almost always having to prove yourself um you know but there there are uh, countries where you're 
your appreciated based on merit. And I think that's probably what drives or what draws a lot of, of our Nigerians, you know, who are well trained to actually go into such a system. The, the environment is, is welcoming. You have all your equipment uh, that you need. You're not going into theater on a day and they say, oh, there's no oxygen today or there's no water today. And, and that's frustrating. And, we, and we've seen that happen. Uh, so people want feel fulfilled when they can actually um, practice what they, um, what, they are, what they have been trained to do. Because, you know, doctors go into this field because we want to help others. So one, you go into theater that day, this person's family member is waiting to say, oh, the tumor that they say my mother has, they're going to take it out today and then we're going to move on in, in the treatment path. But if that doesn't happen on that day, it could be another week, it could be another two weeks, you see what happens, how that affects the psychology of not just the client or the patient, but also their family members. So it, multiple uh, issues, if we can really get the politics right, get the uh, economy right, many more people would actually rather be practicing in Nigeria um, rather than be somewhere else. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Dr. Trace, yeah. tell us more about this, uh, you know, this brain drain issue because it's really, really eating deep into the, the, the healthcare system. How can we stop this? Um, the it's a the I wrote an article uh, last year and I said that we, we are trained, our doctors now are trained in Nigeria and enjoyed around the world. <laughs> because there are two types of young doctors in Nigeria now. Those that are of Nigerian origin, those that have left and those that are waiting to leave. If you do a statistics, you do a poll, you find that about n over 90% are willing and actually making moves to leave. And what is causing them to leave? They are the pull and the push factors. There are things that are pulling them from, uh, from abroad, UK, US, and other places. Those are some of the things she mentioned. Uh, the, the pay, the working environment, and you know security. Doctors die in their numbers, not from work-related issues, but the fact that they live in certain parts of the country. Someone comes in and just shoot and kill them. So, and when they see their colleagues being kidnapped and all that, the next opportunity they have, they want to leave. So these are general societal problems that also affect the doctors. And the doctors being um, a very special type of people, let me use that word. They just want the, they don't like stress. They just want to take the, the next available flight and leave the country. So we're talking about the general security. We're talking about the work environment. In the uh, government hospitals, the working environment is terrible. Basic equipment to work that will give you fulfillment, you don't have. And you are, like she said, you, have, you watch your patient die, not because you don't know what to do, but because the support is not there. No, the equipments are not there. Okay, so these are some of the, um, the reasons that doctors just, they want to exit. Then another strong reason is training opportunities. Um, for you to train medical officers, you know, to become consultant, because that's the ultimate. Every doctor should be a consultant, and that's where you, you actually begin to maximize your potential as a doctor. But such opportunities are rare now, very scarce, because funding is not made available to teaching hospitals. So because of that, instead of opportunity to, to, um, to admit 100 resident doctors into the program, they are admitting maybe 10 or 15 per time. The rest are languishing, just doing general things, working, hitchhiking, working in one small corner or the other, and they get frustrated. But if these people were on the, on the ladder of the training, they know that even if they are not any much today, when they graduate and become specialists, they will be more comfortable. And so those training opportunities are drying up because of funding. 
So the next opportunity they have, they are out because they have to also um, they have to cater for their future. Upgrade so, themselves. Yes, upgrade themselves. So these are some of the major bottlenecks that we have that are causing the doctors to leave. So if to answer the question is to reverse the problem. Funding needs to be make, made available. Teaching hospitals, even house officer slot is difficult. It's, the doctor has a, a, a stu medical student went through six years of medical training, came out. The least problem he should be thinking of is where to do his a mandatory one-year internship. It's not available because of the money to pay them. And so some doctors, some people stay one year after taking the, their uh, Hippocratic oath. They don't have a slot for housemanship, let alone um, residency training. Most slots should be made open for the doctor, doctors who are doing their residency training will, will hardly think of going abroad. Majority, even though, yes, other factors can push them, but it's not as common as those who are coming fresh from the medical school, not, no residency slot, nothing. The next thing is to take the next flight and they're out of the country. And they are, they are going out in their, in their numbers. <laughs> Dr. Obuwa, I know he's uh, real that a lot of uh, challenges there, a lot of uh, issues that should be uh, addressed. But again, there are still some of the doctors here that are uh, giving their best in spite of all the challenges. Do they really feel appreciated or are they really appreciated from your own point of view? Um, so, a lot of times... <coughs> If you're doing what you're doing and doing it well, your clients appreciate it, their family members appreciate it, even your colleagues uh, would appreciate it because uh, as doctors we, especially in my field, it's multidisciplinary, I need the support of other doctors for some of my patients. So that collaboration is really important. And so when, when we actually do what we're supposed to do and do it well, it is appreciated by my uh, end users. Um, sometimes not, because we've seen uh, cases of violence against healthcare, uh, the healthcare workforce. Um, you know, in recent times, where doctors are uh, being attacked by family members, uh, most of it is a lack of you know a lack of communication between the uh, healthcare workforce and the family members. So. Where am I going to? I'm going to the fact that we also need an appropriate attitude as doctors, healthcare workers, because when our clients come to us, they have a lot of anxiety. Uh, then, you know, uh, is, is, is my mother dying? What's the doctor going to tell me today? Uh, so we need an appropriate attitude. We also must have, develop a rapport with our patients, make sure we're communicating things and bringing them on board. Uh, you know, uh, clients today can go into the internet and get information. So when a patient comes to you and says, Doctor, this medicine you're giving me, what is it for you? And you say to them, no, are you the doctor? Have you now become... So that communication is important. And when that, those conditions are met, right attitude towards your patient, because as a doctor, we really should take it as, as a privilege. Patients come to you and tell you everything. They bear everything to you because to some, you're second to God. Because they, they see you now as, oh, God is going to use you to get me to, to be healed or to be cured. So it's important that we take that relationship as sacrosanct. We respect it. We protect the confidentiality. We talk to them with a lot of respect. Have them as part of the management team. And these are all the elements that we put in place when we, when we, uh, when we provide geriatric care. Uh, we involve the patient, we involve the family members. Once we have that uh, depth of relationship and we communicate appropriately, almost always you get that um, appreciation. Uh, what I never forget is the prayers so your patient is leaving your consulting room and they turn around and say to you, Doctor, the God that I serve will bless you. I mean, how much money can you place on that? So there are those who actually 
definitely appreciate what we do. But there's also an environment that we must provide for that, that transparency. They see that you're going on that journey of healing with them. And even when things are not going as planned or as well as you would hope or the patient hopes, we need to, uh, because you're communicating appropriately, they, and, and somebody something bad happens, they're still saying, thank you, doctor, because I know you did your best. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Otabo, please, I, I, I just want you to you know, speak to other young doctors out there because I know you're experienced in, the, in this field because she talked about attitude, attitude, and all, you know, factors. Some uh, doctors, uh, some young doctors, have seen them being in a hurry to do mm -hmm. stuff, and at the end of the day, they end up making some mistake that, of course, they will not, you know, uh, admit to me. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> talk to these young doctors. Okay. <laughs> so, your, um, for the young doctors, um, my first advice is don't put gain first. Don't put money first. If you do that, you're going to make mistakes and you will regret the profession. Money will always come at, at the appropriate time. And um, sacrifice. The, the, the day you choose to be a doctor, you have chosen a life of sacrifice and um, at the end of the day you are not just serving humanity you are also serving god with your knowledge because it's a rare knowledge that is given to only a few people and so much um, trust has been placed in us and we must justify that trust Thank you very You're much. Welcome. Thank you. And that's it on Nigeria today. A very big thank you to our guest, Dr. Ogugua Usi Ubu, Chief Consultant, Physician and Geriatrician, Department of Internal Medicine, National Hospital, Abuja. Thanks for sharing your you know, experience with us. Thank <laughs> you for know. having me. All right. And also Dr. Christopher Otamo, Chief Consultant, Orthopedic Surgeon and Medical Director, Alliance Hospital, Abuja. Thank you for your contribution. Thank you for having me. And to you, our viewer, it's always a pleasure having you there. And don't you forget, Nigeria Today, air weekdays at 7.30 p.m. on NTU News 24. You can watch this and other episodes on www.youtube.com. I am your carrier, Clinton. Thank you for watching.